Hey, what's going on guys? Mike here, back with another setup video, this time with a lot more detail. We're gonna be going over the process of setting up the 90 gallon tank, which you can kind of see behind me. But before we do that, let's set the stage here a little bit. So I had my 90 gallon tank sitting on the porch out there all summer. And honestly, after trying to sell it on Craigslist for about three months with no luck, I finally got to the point where I knew I needed to just set it up again. But with little to no room left in the garage, AKA the aquarium lab, I had to improvise a little. So let's go ahead and get right into the build. Alright guys, so pretty much the last spot available to set up a tank out here is up on this portion of the workbench. It fits almost perfectly in between the cabinets on the left and the ledge here on the right. The depth ended up being perfect as well and I had enough room for more than a few inches in the back which is something that you always want. Remember that you also always want your tank to be level and luckily this countertop was right on. So once I had the placement of the tank and the tank was all cleaned out, I was pretty much all ready to go. I'm going to get into all the gear that I use for this setup as we get into it into the build. Let's just get right into the aquascaping. So for this scape, I knew I wanted manzanita wood as more or less the focal point, so I started to mess around with a couple of pieces. I also knew that I wanted some big hills in this tank, so I took a page from ADU Aquascaping's book and filled up a few mesh bags with lava rocks that will end up serving as a filler for some of the dramatic slopes that I wanted to create. This is a super cost effective method as lava rock is really cheap and it's much better in my opinion than trying to just dump a bunch of gravel in one spot. Having these rocks in a mesh bag is also going to make everything about the process easier. If you guys haven't checked out Dave's channel and you're into aquascaping, you totally need to. This dude is crazy good at aquascaping and there's a lot to learn over there, so I'll throw his channel down in the description. Anyways, I just started by moving the bags around the tank and playing around with the position of the wood. I decided on a couple bags here on the right with the wood wedged in between them and a bag over here on the left. This is going to help keep the wood weighted down, especially since one of the pieces here isn't fully waterlogged yet. Now once I was happy with the layout, it was time to add my nutrient substrate, which for me is always soil. It's about 20 times cheaper than any inorganic substrate you'll buy online or at the fish store, and in my opinion, it just works better. You can't beat it guys, seriously, if you haven't tried soil, you need to go set up a tank with it right now. I'm just using organic soil primarily because it doesn't contain any added nitrate and I like the balance of nitrogen, potassium, and phosphate it has. You don't have to use organic, but I have to recommend it since it's what I use every time. The brand is not important here, this was just the cheapest stuff at Home Depot. So I'm just going to start pouring it in. We're going ultra basic here, I'm choosing not to add anything special this time like laterite, vermiculite, or anything like that. But I will add something in you might not expect here in a minute and I'll explain more. Once I get a few heaps of soil in, I then go through it and break up any big clumps, and that's pretty much it. If you see any large wood chips, you can take them out, but this bag is looking pretty good so far. I don't sift the soil or anything, and I definitely don't mineralize my soil. That's a whole other can of worms that I'm not going to get into here in this video. Let me know if you guys are interested in that kind of stuff though, it's on my list of videos to make, and I'll move it up if there's more interest. So anyway, as I add the soil, I spread it out as I go, and I'm always conscious of how much I'm adding. My goal here is to of course cover my lava rock hills, but also to maintain about 1.5 to 3 inches of soil in every area of the tank. There's a lot of drama out there about adding too much soil and how it can create severely anaerobic areas of the substrate that will end up killing plant roots. But in my experience, this is really hard to do for several reasons. I honestly don't think you guys should worry about it too much. I think it's more important to focus on making sure you have enough soil in specific areas where you're eventually going to have heavy root feeding plants and things like that. I like to use the front of the tank as a guide to make sure that I have an appropriate depth. Don't forget that you can always stick a ruler into areas where you're unsure. Now once I have a pretty good first layer down, I then wet the soil down to compact it a bit and get it soaking up some water. This is a really important step, just don't go crazy here. It's going to end up being really messy later on if you create a bunch of standing water in the tank, so definitely try and avoid that. Next I started to add some hardscape objects to the tank which ended up being some medium sized pieces of boulder lava which is what I've been using in all of my tanks for a while now. You'll notice that some of the portions of the mesh bags are not completely covered yet but I'll fill that in later after the rocks are in place. So 
So once that's done, I go ahead and wet the new soil down just like I had before. Now it's time to start adding the top layer substrate. For this build, I'm using the same sand that I used in my 72 gallon bow front, which is a Monterey beach sand. It's fairly coarse. I can't remember exactly what grit it is specifically, but I really like it. I also like the lighter colored substrate these days, but that's always changing. Now before we add this sand, I wanna first sprinkle in some secret substrate powder. Okay, it's not really supposed to be a secret, guys. It's a mixture of magnesium, calcium, and potassium, which I feel really helps out some certain plants, especially the s repins that I know I'm gonna be putting here in the front. So I just lightly sprinkle some in, water it in a little bit, and then call it good. Now it's time to add in that sand, and I do it pretty much the same way that I added the soil. This time I make sure to pour it in thick in the back so that I can slope it nicely to the front. With pretty much all the sand in place and smoothed out, it's time to wet it down just like all the other previous wetting steps. This is also going to help some of the sand in the hilly parts of the tank melt down into a secure position. You can see that the cap here in the front is about equal to the depth of the soil, and it ended up being a lot thicker here in the back, which is totally fine. Now we can go ahead and fill the tank up. I like to point a really slow stream of water onto a plate to help prevent any substrate disruption. When the tank is about half full, I like to start adding my plants. I added one Cryptocorini Retrospiralis as close to the middle of the driftwood as possible, as well as some Blixa around the rocks here on the right. Next I added in some S. Repins on the face of the hill here, and some Pogo Stame on Helferi over on the left, as well as some Luguigia Super Red in the back left and right sides. After this first round of planting, it was getting pretty late, so I filled the tank up and threw in a wave maker to call it a night. In most of the setups I do, I get everything going on the first day. The only thing I was missing here was my filter, but I was waiting on a pump to come in the mail, so I had to skip it for now. So the next day when we come out to the tank, the first thing you'll notice is the massive amount of turbidity in the water column. This is something that's super common for newly set up tanks, especially those with soil, and it's exacerbated by the current created by the wave maker. Without the constant circulation of water, we wouldn't get such a murky tank, but it's always a good idea to get this phase of released colored organics and other chemicals that come from the substrates, which cause turbidity out of the way right off the bat. All we do now is a big water change and we don't have this problem anymore. The next steps involve finishing up the aquascaping. I added a few large pieces of java fern, one behind the wood and the other here on the left next to the Luigia. So now we have to fast forward about a week and a half here because I ended up going back and forth on the filter arrangement as well as what lighting I wanted to use. A few days prior to this, I hooked up the filter, finalized the lighting and I'll talk about both of these in a second. First, a few things you'll notice here is that the Luigia has grown a lot, and we ended up getting a ton of melting in the Blixa, S. Repins, and the Pogo Stamon. This is a totally normal thing to happen to these plants in particular, since they're slightly more sensitive to water parameters than the Java Fern and the Luigia. It's something that doesn't happen 100% of the time, but we just ended up getting a little unlucky. The plants aren't completely dead, actually not dead at all. The root systems are intact and still viable, and if you look very closely, you can see that most of them have areas of new growth which are still viable. They'll end up making a recovery, it's just gonna take some time. So what I do to help the aquascape along is just add in some new plants of each kind. Now that the water conditions are more stable, these plants shouldn't go through anything close to what happened previously. If I could go back in time, I would wait on adding these specific plants to avoid that massive melt, but hindsight's always 2020, right? So let's finally talk about the gear on this tank. I decided to run my broken two liter flask filter because one, it's by far my favorite looking filter, and two, I want to eventually show that big filters with fast flow rates are not always required on decently stocked planted tanks. The flask contains less than two liters of bio balls and the flow rate through this filter is about 170 gallons per hour based on the pump I'm using and the head height which is way under what is typically recommended. For the light, I ended up going with the Planted Plus 24-7 fixture, which I know is not gonna be enough light for this tank. Because of the depth and especially the width of this 90 gallon, it's really gonna require two of these fixtures if we wanna get even close to what would be considered high light. We're gonna play around with this fixture for a month or so, see how things go, and then most likely get another one or just end up going back to some T5HOs. I'm working on a review for both the Planted 24-7 and the Agrobrite T5 fixtures that I have over on the 125, 
where I'll go into more detail and share some of the reasoning behind why I still prefer T5s. I'm using pressurized CO2 on this tank and at this point I still haven't gotten in my glass diffuser yet so I'm just sending it through an air stone which I'm sure you guys know isn't the way to go. A few days later it came in and I also got a little inline bubble counter here which is meant for a much smaller setup but I just wanted to try something new. You guys know that I like to make my own counters out of flasks but unfortunately I didn't have one available. The heater is just a random 200 watt that I had laying around and the circulation pump again here is an RW4, another product that I need to do a review of. I'll put links to all the gear I just talked about as well as the future things that come up in the build in the description so you can check them out if you want some more info. At this point I then did some trimming of the Laguigia here since it was getting close to the top of the tank. I just go about halfway down on some of the longer stems give them a cut, and place them back into areas where I still have some available substrate. Ludwigia is one of those stem plants that seems to have a shelf life with respect to propagation. You can only cut it back so many times before it starts to get a little nutty. It's just going to go through phases where it looks good and then doesn't look good, so you need to have a little patience. I'll probably just end up taking out both sides and replacing it with something else down the road. I also decided to add in some Altananthera Raniki Mini here on the left in front of these rocks and in the back right here close to the middle. This back spot is super low light and it's not a great spot for this plant, but I'm just trying some stuff out. This is always how the best learning takes place. Now let's talk quickly here about cycling. All you need for this are some simple API ammonia nitrite and nitrate test kits and a source of ammonia to start the process. There's a bunch of different stuff out there that you can use as an ammonia source. I like to use liquid ammonium chloride. I have a whole separate video about the nitrogen cycle, so if you guys need some more info, check out the description for a link. I add enough of the ammonium solution to bring the concentration up to about 6 ppms, and then we wait. It only took a couple of days to start seeing nitrite, but then it took about two more weeks to see it all disappear. Ammonia oxidizers are much faster growing organisms than nitrite oxidizers, so it makes sense that we always see this phenomenon. Within this period of waiting for the cycle to complete, I was doing water changes to help prevent algae. I just made sure to add back in a little bit of ammonium each time to keep my ammonia oxidizers happy. We want them specifically to be in really good shape once we add fish. Once the ammonia and the nitrite is undetectable on the test kit and the nitrate concentrations are close to or below 30 ppm, you can now safely add fish. So now let's fast forward another two weeks guys. The tank still doesn't have fish because I'm waiting for something fun that I'll talk about in an upcoming video, but let's take another look here at the tank. I've reshuffled a few of the plants and have propagated the Altananthera a couple of times to help spread it out. I also added a few more pogo stamons on the left and made an open space here up on this shelf for something, maybe just a few more pogos, but I'm not quite sure yet. The S repens is filled in a little bit more here on the hill, but overall most of the plants in here with the exception of the java fern and the laguigia could really use some more light. Comparing some of these plants to the same ones that I have over in the 72 where the lighting is more adequate, they're doing a little bit better. Both tanks have a lot of CO2 pumping through them and pretty much identical substrates, so light is really the only difference. Again, the lighting situation is something that I'll probably be tweaking here in the next couple weeks. I also want to add that I haven't really had any algae problems in this tank, just a little bit on the glass here and there. Keeping light the limiting growth factor really helps this out, but you can also see the potential drawback of that being some lackluster plant growth. Consistent water changes are definitely the other piece of the puzzle when it comes to keeping algae at a minimum. Okay guys, so that's going to just about wrap it up here for the 90 gallon setup. I obviously still need to add fish to this tank and I'll be following this up in an upcoming video in the next few days. Spoiler alert, you're going to be the ones that pick the livestock for this tank and I'll let you know how we're going to go about doing that in that video. Just make sure that you head over and follow DIY Aquapros on Instagram and Facebook to stay in the loop. Now the last thing that I want to tell you guys is that if you really want to dive into the planted aquarium hobby, you need to get Diana Wallstad's book, Ecology of the Planted Aquarium. It's literally one of, if not the best pieces of literature out there. I'll throw a link to it down in the description. Trust me, you won't be disappointed if you pick it up. Hey, thanks for watching guys. I hope you enjoyed this video, even if you're already a pro at Planted Tanks. I really appreciate all the support you guys have been showing lately, and I'm really excited to dive back into the channel. Don't forget to subscribe and leave this video a big thumbs up. We'll see you next time.